Uh, it's the first item on the agenda. I want to welcome uh, Minister Darren, senior officials. Um, and do you wish to make some opening remarks? Oh, happy with Good that. to go. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So there's, there are 18 amendments uh, tabled to this bill, uh, and we now deal with section one of the bill. The section one is some part of the bill. Do you want to address that, Minister? He doesn't. Um, section two then is amendment one in the name of Deputy Doherty. Uh, I move amendment number one, and these are grouped with uh, amendment two, five, and six also. So I'll speak to all four amendments. Um, the first, that's uh, okay. Ireland, we'll forgive you this time. Okay. Uh, the amendment number one and two uh, are, are are similar, and it deals with consistency within the bill in terms of the, the change in amendment one would need to take place again in section three. Amendment number five and six uh, are linked because what it does is it deletes the definition that is in the bill uh, and replaces it with a different definition. So in relation to uh, these groups of amendments, the, the, these amendments are about consistency, Minister. Uh, the Minister will call the Insurance Amendment Act that we passed recently in these houses. Uh, that also made the provision for claims to be made for this, those uh, uh, the, the, those that had insurance with Satanta or claims in relation to Satanta, and I understand on a side note that those claims are going to be made, or those payments are going to be made uh, later this week, early next week, which is something that is uh, is very welcome. Um, but the Insurance Amendment Act consistently used the language of risk in the state. So therefore, it would seem logical that we would use the same wording here rather than Irish-based risks. Uh, Amendment six defines this uh, as per the Act, uh, the 2001, sorry, the 2011 Act. So, what Amendment five does is deletes the definition that's in this bill and replaces it. What is it? What is in the 2011 bill, which looks at consistency in terms of how we are interpreting uh, risk. The minister's own definition, which um, I, as I said in Amendment five, deletes, says Irish-based risk means a risk falling within the relevant class of non-life insurance that, by virtue of regulations under seven, subsection one, is regarded for the purposes of the Act as a risk based in the state. So the current ten, uh, text ends up defining the subject as a risk based in the state. If we go back to the 2011 Act, the same definition as I'm suggesting here is used. Otherwise, we would have a bill, this bill defining Irish-based risks and another two different acts that we've already passed defining risks in the state. And there is a lack of consistency here. Then we have the entire section seven of the bill, which we'll discuss in more detail later on, which talks about risks based in the state. Um, we will, as I said, discuss that section, but it allows the central bank to make regulations specifying what counts as risk based in the state, but we already have a definition for that. So the only reason that I can see in terms of a redefinition, which is what's included in this bill, is to limit the range of insurances that would be caught by the definition. Uh, and it seems confusing given that we have uh, two previous acts that, that, that define this as uh, risks in the state as opposed to Irish-based risks, which we're now trying to introduce. Uh, and what these amendments and groups of amendments do is argue the point that we should be using the definition that is already established, used in uh, numerous pieces of legislation. And uh, the question is, is there any reason any non-life insurance should be excluded from the database? Minister. Yeah, thank you, Deputy. Um, I'll just go through the note and then I'll, I'll comment back on, on your comments, then, Deputy. The amendment is opposed on the basis that it travels with a substantive amendment to Section 4, which is also opposed. It is intended that risks in the state should be defined by regulation rather than the primary legislation to minimise the need to amend the legislation in the future. The amendments are opposed in terms of 5 and 6. Uh, on the basis that the incremental way in which the relevant classes of non-life insurance will be provided for by in the database over time. So an example of this is we're, we're starting with motor insurance. It means that so much of the text of the amendment would not be initially relevant or appropriate. The definition of a risk in the state, which is used by the deputy, is that which is used in the Insurance Act 64 in relation to the framework for compensation in the event of an insurance insolvency or administration. That 64 Act definition 
has been split out in terms of what risks are excluded and uses categories which may not be contemplated in terms of the database. So for example here is travel insurance. The current drafting requires the central bank to provide for the definition of an Irish based risk in this bill to be analogous to that 1964 Act definition while providing flexibility to vary it where appropriate. The Office of the Parliamentary Council believes that the current drafting better serves the purpose of defining the risk in the state for this bill rather than using the 64 Act. Um, to, be, to be frank about it, Deputy, it's a kind of a whether or which. The OPC believe that what we have in place is better than what you're proposing. Um, and it, it certainly is not to limit uh, the definition within the Act of what information will be calculated by the central bank. Actually, quite the opposite. We want to leave it open. We want to leave it in the manner that it is so that it is open for all information from different um, streams to be calculated by the central bank so rather than being prescriptive. Okay. Um, the, would it not then follow that we should be amending the previous legislation, the 64 Act and the 2011 Act, to have consistency in relation to what we're saying? Because we're now introducing a different category of risk uh, that is an Irish-based risk as opposed to what is already established, which is a risk to the state. Would that be defined uh, in, in those acts? Yeah, we're satisfied it isn't required, Deputy. What, what this is doing does exactly what we require it to do, which is to collect the information, collate the information uh, for all of the areas of insurance that we think may come and flow. Not to, we're starting with motor, and then we will flow then over a period between other areas to be calculated. We're, we're satisfied it isn't required. And we're satisfied that there isn't an issue of consistency. Um, but it's kind of a whether or which, Deputy, is what I'm saying. Um, the OPC believe what we're doing and how we're doing it is the better way to do it. And that's, is that just solely for the purpose that it would allow for more categories of insurance to be captured? As a, yes. And is that the sole purpose of, of...? Yes. So it's open in the manner that it is, so that it isn't prescriptive. Regulation can subsequently be used if required. Okay. But the Act itself then is sufficient and we don't need any more or less. Okay. Can I ask, it, notwithstanding the, the, the fact that the Minister has put his views on the record, that if a note between now and report stage yeah. uh, could be given in relation to just the two different categories and why, uh, in, 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 in your view, that an Irish-based risk would allow for a, a more expanded version of uh, insurance to, well, be, to, you, to be captured? The, the example that we use was travel insurance. So if somebody travels out of the country and uh, so the term that you're putting, presenting is an, to delete an Irish-based risk. We would be able to use that for travel insurance, but a risk in the state potentially may not be. But sure. Yeah, just clarify there, so the case of travel insurance, the wording currently there, Irish-based risk, would encompass yes. travel in, insurance in where in an incident future. would arise abroad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, can I just ask just at this yeah, point, yeah. right, and I, w I would like to note, but can I ask you just in relation to, because we're talking about these groups of amendment, and the, the example you've given is travel insurance, which sounds fine, but amendment number six defines a risk in the state, which is what's already included in the legislation, so it's not coming from my pen, it's, it's coming from what we've already passed. And if you see that subsection C of what's already in there says a risk relating to travel or holidays where the policyholder took out the policy in the state and the duration of the policy is four months or less. So how does that stack against the fact that you're suggesting that the existing criteria doesn't actually include travel insurance given that it's explicitly stated in it that it does? It is, but the point I'm making, if your amendment flows, that could be excluded. How could it be excluded? So this is defining. This is what's defining the risk in the state. Um, no, it could be excluded. But this is saying the 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 amendment six, which actually takes from what is already there, says that risk in the state in relation to a risk under insurance policy means a risk that is not an excluded risk and that is 
and then we go to category C, a risk relating to travel or holidays where the policyholder took out the policy in the state. That's if, that's if yours flows subsequently. So that's your amendment subsequently is taken in. Yes. Yeah. So. But we're dealing with the grip of amendments, oh, and I, yeah, the, these are linked. Like, there's no point. Sorry, there's no point. There's no point changing this criteria without changing the definition. You know, without I, I, including the definition of what the criteria is. Like, you would obviously have to delete the. The, the, the section five, because then you would have criteria in for something that doesn't exist, and you'd need to put section six or my amendment six in. But that's just one that could be used in the future. You're, you're, I was only talking about sections, sorry, one and two in terms of risk to the state. I use that as an example. If yours flows subsequently, uh, but that we're trying to leave it as open as possible, to take in as much as possible. If we Potentially, there are others that will be excluded with your definition. That's which, what the OPC. But yeah. which ones would be excluded, Minister? Because we've kind of established that the suggestion that travel insurance would be excluded is not the case, because it's explicitly stated that that is what is the risk in the state. That's an, that's if your one, if your subsequent six flows. So, so the, the full gambit of this is to try and leave it open so we can bring in others. But the full focus for now is motor and employer's liability, public liability. Subsequent to that, if others flow, that can be used. Will travel be used in the future? I, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps not. No, no, what I, what I, because what, look, the, we've put down number, tabled a number of amendments, which really is just about improving the bill. There's not an ideological issue here in terms of it. But I would ask maybe that that report, you know, I, I've outlined what is needed in terms of a note, but if that could yeah. be furnished we, we to us before yeah. report stage. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I do intend, my intention at this point in time would be to revisit this and to press That's these right. amendments. I feel strongly about it, but I, I want to give the officials the an point that I'm making, Deputy, is it's kind of a whether or which, you know, is it could go in, it could not. The OPC say what we have captures it better rather than being as prescriptive as you are. So we don't want to have the legislation prescriptive so that if there is a change required in the future, that can be changed by regulation, whereas if it's prescribed in the actual legislation, uh, we need to change legislation in the future. Uh, my final point on that there is that works both ways, because when we prescribe stuff as elected members of their octas, then it needs to be captured. When we don't prescribe stuff, then it doesn't need to be captured. But we're satisfied, and the OPC is very clear on this, we're satisfied that it is these are captured. Are you we'll get to know. Give uh, we'll do uh, the committee a uh, comprehensive note. Yeah. So the amendment then, Deputy Darty, how does it stand? Withdraw amendment one. Okay, that's section two stand part of the bill. Agreed? Agreed. Section three then, amendment two, already discussed with one. I move and withdraw it. Withdraw it. Uh, that's section three stand part, oh, sorry, yes, yeah, section three stand part of the bill. Um, on section three, our, our amendment three, uh, three and seven, um, is that in this section? Oh, we have to agree section three before we go into okay. amendment three then. So okay. section three agreed? Yes, Sorry, just Deputy three. Three. So just in relation to the scope of this database, Minister, um, so it's going to start with um, motor insurance claims, so relevant non-life insurance businesses which uh, is defined in, in Section 3. Um, how quickly can it be expanded, in your view, to deal with uh, other forms of non-life insurance, particularly yeah. employer liability and public liability? Well, everything we've done to date and the work that the Central Bank have done to date as well is just to focus initially on motor. Um, motor takes up a pretty large percentage, the majority, uh, in, claim, in, in terms of number of claims. Um, when can it move? I would hope so sooner rather than later, but I don't want to be, I don't want to put on the record a date that I'm unsure can, can actually happen. The central bank are doing a feasibility study. Yeah, so yeah, the central bank are doing a feasibility study. So the work, so the first thing they have to do, they're doing a 10 year look backwards in terms of all the different form, 
uh, channels, settlement channels, all the different sections of insurance within motor. So you're looking at windscreen, you're looking at theft, you're looking at fire, you're looking at accidents, personal liability. So there's actually a really big body of work to do to get a 10 year look back. Subsequent to that 10 year look back, the database will be updated then as each period flows with an annual report. So I can't say for certain when um, to be able to move from motor into the next section. And sorry, through the chair, will the uh, will that historic look back, that ten year of data, uh, will that be brought into the database? Yes, yes. it will. So okay. it's it'll be it'll revert back effectively to two thousand and eight data to be calculated for the establishment of this structure. So it'll be populated into yeah. the, the into database. The, into the new database. Yeah. Okay. So Thanks. it won't be start. The database won't start with information from. January 119 and flow from there. There will be the 10 year de decadal view backwards, and that information has to be compiled. So there's a big body of work early to be done. But the central bank are doing a feasibility study about exactly when to be able to move from motor then subsequently. And just finally, is, is that 10 year data set available and in the format required for it to? And make its way into the database and be usable. The, the, central, bank is working the central bank have been working with insurance companies um, for that information flow over the last period. So as the legislation has been mooted and, and prepared, they have been doing some of that work already. Okay, thanks. That's section three then, stand part of the bill. Agreed. Uh, section four then, uh, Deputy Doherty, Amendment three. Taking three and seven are related, discussed together. Yeah, I, I move Amendment three, and um, as the chair said, Amendment seven is is, is grouped. Although I, I don't see that they're cr closely related at all. But that that said, I'll I'll, I'll deal with them together. <coughs> Minister, if we look at the blue book, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if we look at the blue book, there were specific headings in relation to how you define business expenses. And this is a, a critical issue because it, uh, it, it sets the parameters for insurers that they must follow or else you're effectively allowing them to, to self-declare. Uh, for example, in returns in respect of non-life insurance businesses, uh, they mustn't be distorted by agreements related between uh, companies concerned or by arrangements which could give effect to the apportionment of expenses or, and income. Management expenses shouldn't be charged to underwriting accounts, including director's fees, foreign exchange gains, losses related to investment or other, other than those attributable to the underwriting account. What this amendment is trying to do is to tighten up on what can be declared as expenses and to distinguish between what are genuine business expense costs and what are distortionary bookkeeping exercises. I, I've given an example of how they can be inflated. This is the place where we need to do this is the primary legislation. It's important that parameters are set down here and at this time. Uh, it, it's important in my view that everything isn't delegated to the central bank, that we need to decide on, on certain parameters. Uh, and we know this because we know that we're, we're dealing with people trying to get insurance and we must do everything to ensure that the database uh, helps them in, in that and the either of getting insurance at a, a reasonable price. So this is about tightening up and making sure that there can't be an, an inflation or, um, <coughs> or bookkeeping exercise in terms of, uh, of expenses uh, that, that can be declared. Amendment 7, as I said, which isn't related in my view to this, but anyway, um, what it does is it, it outlines a number of steps uh, which can be counted uh, in relation to this section. Uh, and this is in relation to probably the issue of transparency, which we need to get to the core of. Uh, and, and the issue in Amendment No. 7 is in relation to the out-of-court dis discussions through unofficial channels which are not recorded in any way. So by adding these two additional non-formal steps, what I'm trying to ensure is that the, uh, that the data collected includes these informal discussions, which aren't captured in the bill at the minute. And these informal discussions, which would be captured if this amendment was, 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 uh, was accepted, would be the direct negotiations after registration of the claim, 
uh, by the claimant under the Personal Injuries Assessment Board Act, but before the respondent consents or declines to a formal assessment pro processing progressing. And the second uh, one that would be captured would be the direct no negotiation after consent by the respondent to a formal assessment, but before a final award is made under the Personal Injuries Assessment Board uh, or final determination of the claim by the acceptance of both parties or by default or of rejection by the respondents of the formal award under the Personal Industries Assessment Board. Currently, this, these areas would not be captured, in my view, under the Bill, uh, and this is important in relation to having the full data available that we know what is happening uh, through informal channels and other parts of, uh, of, of resolutions uh, so that all of the data is captured in relation to this database. <clears throat> Chair. Yes, um, the items mentioned in amendment above, which, which is amendment uh, 3, already fall within the existing definition, Deputy. The approach of indiv individually specifying this level of detail is not in keeping with the general drafting approach taken in the Bill, which proposes to set out down in primary legislation the framework within which the central bank is to establish and administer the claims database, allowing the specific approach to evolve over time. It is intended that the data to be collected from insurers would be defined by regulation rather than the primary legislation. To minimize the need to amend the legislation as the level of data collected in the future becomes more detailed. The Central Bank has informed me that will take the substance of this amendment into account when it finalizes its data specification so that the data outlined is collected in this way. Um, so, the, the, your point also, Deputy, about the distortionary bookkeeping exercises, well, th they're not going to be acceptable to anybody, let alone the central bank. You know, that's, that's a sharp practice that certainly couldn't be accommodated anywhere. In terms of Amendment uh, 7, uh, it is, the amendment is opposed on the basis that it is compromised, oh, sorry, comprised of detail which is unnecessary to drill down into the primary legislation. Again, which is appropriately covered already in the existing text. In this regard, I believe that the existing provision, which provides for the employment of the procedures under the Personal Injury Assessment Board, covers all the cases which come within the scope, including those set out in the amendment. So again, similarly, it's covered already. The Office of the Primary Council has also highlighted in respect to this provision that there are deficiencies in the terminology used in the amendment which as such does not properly reflect the wording of the original 2003 uh, PIAB Act referenced. In addition, by trying to break down the PIAB process into a series of component parts, we run the risk of missing out on certain elements. For example, having consulted directly with PIAB, we understand that the proposed amendment may not cover cases that PIAB releases almost immediately under Section 17 of the PIAB Act, where consent hasn't been sought at all from the respondents. Uh, these may be cases such as wholly psychological bullying, abuse cases, and more that may ultimately settle after concluding the buyer process. This means that there's a possibility that this will not allow for all settlements made in the buyer process to be captured, thereby unintentionally decreasing the scope of the information that may subsequently be captured. On this basis, uh, the existing text captures all the scenarios within the PIAB, uh, and I don't think it advises the committee to accept this amendment. Can I ask, just um, in relation to the latter amendment, no, amendment number seven, is it what section of the Act are you saying that it already covers the uh, the two um, subsections that I want to uh, include? Section three, three B, three B, three B, yeah, after B. No, 3B. Oh, sorry, B, sorry, yes, B, yeah, yeah. So 3B. 3B. So you, the you, original pie Act. Okay. Um, I, I, will, I will come back to that uh, and, and reflect on what you said in, in relation to that issue. Um, in, in terms of being prescriptive, and the reality is, like, these insurance companies are not to be trusted. Like, they're under investigation for cartel-like, you know, activities. They were raided uh, by European authorities. Um, and, you know, I have no bones in saying that. They are ripping people off, absolutely ripping people off. I got an email late last night from a person 
who again was just getting their motor insurance, but they're being fleeced because they're, 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 they can't pay the insurance up front. And these insurance companies are allowed then to add on additional because that they're paying in, in monthly instalments and all the rest. And no matter what way people turn, they feel that they're just being seriously under pressure in terms of, uh, of motor insurance. So I, I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them, to tell you the God's honest truth. Um, and that's why we know that this happens. We know that how... Um, you know that businesses and accountants will actually look at uh, how you can actually uh, offset expenses from a subsidiary here to a subsidiary there, and, and a different way to present figures uh, in, in, in a way that best suits the industry in relation to this. What this amendment uh, number three does uh, doesn't um, <clears throat> doesn't limit. Uh, how business uh, expenses would be defined, but what it does is it sets out clearly that this is what it ne what it needs to include, and therefore I don't hear any reason why that shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be included here. Um, you talk about, and you're completely right, that it is maybe not in keeping with the, with the drafting of the bill, but you'll see in terms of a number of my amendments that actually what I believe that we need to be doing here as legislators, after what we've come through, after why we know that this is needed, that we need to be not, not agreeing a loose piece of legislation that allows for the central bank, uh, you know, and a, 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 a trust in the central bank, but allows for the central bank then to go and interpret what we as legislators would like to do. The uh, central bank are independent, but independent in, in regards of actually implementing acts that are passed and using powers that are passed by the House of the Office. There is an, an interaction, and this is where the interaction is, where we set down the ground rules in relation to how uh, this issue will be dealt with. So, yes, we do need to be a bit more prescriptive, um, because the reality is this has been happening, and the central bank weren't the great consumer protectors out there for, for people as they've seen, you know, increases over a three-year period of, uh, of 70 per cent. You know, like they, they, weren't, they weren't the great consumer protector when it came to, the, uh, when it came to the, the, the scandals and trackers and others and all the rest. So there is an onus on us to actually be, uh, you know, to a certain degree a bit prescriptive, and that is what Section 3 attempts to do. Uh, sorry, the Amendment 3 attempts to do, which is trying to ensure and as far as possible that we can, that we will, won't see the industry using uh, their, their accountants to try and uh, to, to, to cook the books, basically, to, 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 you know, to, to, to use this business expenses as a way of, of, of reducing um, the, 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 the figures that they will present in relation to the claims database. Deputy, you might be shocked to hear him. I'm going to agree with you on, on some of it. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I am pleased with the method in which the central bank have taken consumer protection into uh, their bosom. The reality is, in my view, the central bank are much more concerned about prudential regulation than they are about consumer protection. Uh, I think that's a fair criticism by you, and I agree with that. Um, in terms of business expenses. I don't have the figure offhand, but the figure is 90% plus in terms of the funds outlaid by insurance companies on awards. So when you're talking about the business expenses, um, the business expenses, you use the term cooking the books. It's not a term I'm going to use, um, but in the scheme of things, the small amount is actually the business expense. The much larger amount is the levels of award that are paid out in this jurisdiction. We've had this conversation before. I've made that point to you. Um, if you're satisfied, Deputy, uh, I'm prepared to give a commitment that what, what you're asking for can be captured by the regulation rather than primary legislation. This legislation is designed so that the primary, we don't, we are not prescriptive in the primary legislation, so the flexibility is there within the central bank to capture everything that we want to capture in the future. It's much easier to alter a regulation rather than the legislation. I withdraw amendment number three, but I, I, I may submit this again at report stage. Okay, uh, withdrawn. Uh, amendment four. Okay, number four. Um, again, this seems to this this attempts to capture the informal back and forth that goes on, and mainly to settlements that uh, are not being recorded. 
the current definition in, in, of direct negotiation, which is on page 4 of the Bill, uh, section 4, uh, is, is very limited and is more a definition of formal negotiation as opposed to, to direct negotiation. Uh, I, I believe that we need uh, you know, a full picture in this here. So what this does, very simply, is it makes it clear that this would uh, involve not just, um, as it already says, includes negotiation involving in whole and in part the services of a solicitor or council, but it would add by either the claimant or the insurance undertaking, or by both, so to, to make it very clear that if there is only one side uh, with a solicitor or counsel, that that is deemed as direct negotiation and it can be uh, it can be captured. Yeah. Again. Yeah, just, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. just, why is it that direct negotiation in the definition is limited to the, the formal type of negotiation involving legal representatives? Uh, I mean, some people do their own negotiations with these firms. And is, yeah. is that captured elsewhere? And if so, yeah. where? Well, again, the amendment is opposing based that the Office of Primary Council has given a legal opinion that this is unnecessary, as the generality of the current drafting already provides for this. Uh, so again, the bill is designed in a particular way so that if there are alterations required in the future, that regulation can be changed much easier than the legislation. So again, they're satisfied that it, it is already covered. The definition can't be changed by regulation, Minister. The definition can only be changed by the approval of the House of Baractus. Um, and the definition here has direct negotiation, which includes negotiation involving the whole or part of the service of a solicitor or counsel. What this does, and I ask you to reflect on this here, because I don't think this takes away from it, unless there's a legal issue that... Uh, arises from the AG's office, I'm happy to hear that, but this just makes it very clear that this is by either the claimant or the insurance undertaking or by both, uh, because the, the interpretation of this could lead to uh, what would be defined as a more formal negotiation between two sets of, uh, sets of councils or solicitors, um, as opposed to uh, an individual making contact with uh, an insurance uh, solicitor, insurance company's legal representatives in terms of uh, a, an agreement or a settlement which so, wouldn't be captured. So there be de direct negotiations, so that says that is, is in part the service our citizen our council includes, but direct negotiations means any direct negotiations, and that is not limited to the situation where it is a legal person. But it, it's all direct negotiations. But that's not what the bill says, Minister. Like, I, I appreciate that that's obviously the intention that you have, but we have to look here in terms of what is what is stated in the legislation, and it doesn't say it's all negotiations. It, it no. says it includes negotiations involving the whole of the services, solicitor and counsel. It, but that's included, but direct negotiations, this is not limited to the situation where it is a legal person representative. So direct negotiation is... All negotiations. But where that's not that's not there. It doesn't say that in the legislation. I said, I said, well, deputy direct negotiation as an interpretation. That's where one person negotiates with another. That's direct negotiations. Yeah, but look, we know what direct negotiation is. But when we're drafting law, we put the words direct negotiation and, and then we define it for the purpose of this Act. And for the purpose of this Act, direct negotiations, as you have outlined, isn't what is stated in this Act. It is not stipulated in this Act that that is what, it, what direct negotiation is. It is actually says it includes negotiation involving in whole or in part the service of a solicitor or counsel, full stop, nothing else. Yeah. The OPC is very clear that direct negotiations, any negotiations that occur on behalf of person and they're satisfied with with that they're satisfied that it covers the intent that you have that it's covered okay um, well I'm, I'm not satisfied with that answer but um, you know I, I tabled this uh, because I wanted to hear what the, the, the yeah. minister and your officials have to say um, but I, I, I think that that's very loose, and it doesn't appear to be what is on the uh, uh, in the legislation. Um, that, that that said, I'll withdraw it and and uh, let's review it. Number before you do that, we were discussing four and eight together. <coughs>
Sorry. That you want to pick up that, eh? Four and eight. And eight, yeah. So um, I moved, I moved uh, Amendment 4 and 8. Let me just see. Uh, oh, yes. Amendment 8 is in relation to the mediation. So this, this, uh, is, this is very much uh, similar to the point I was making in Amendment number 4. We now have a Mediation Act. Uh, l let me just reflect on what the long title tells us uh, as its purpose. It says it is to facilitate the settlement of disputes by mediation, to specify the principles applicable to mediation, to specify arrangements for mediation as an alternative to the institution of civil proceedings or the continuation of civil proceedings that have instituted. So the question is, why would this not be included as in the bill as a step to take into account uh, in, in, in relation to uh, what, what would be included. And, and what this uh, basically does is it inserts uh, in page five, it inserts an, an additionality which says, or mediation as per the Mediation Act 2017. It's obviously a process that is now legally underpinned by statute and should be included as, a, 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 as part of the uh, steps that would be taken into account. Thanks, Chair. Yes, uh, the, again, Deputy DOPC opposed this on the basis that it's not necessary that it's already covered. But um, what, I, what we could do is we could uh, work with you to try and get a report stage amendment in if you want to have this inserted into the Act. Okay, I appreciate that, uh, Minister. Um, so, on Amendment 4, um, I, I move and withdraw. Drawn. So, um, Amendment 5 then uh, discussed already with uh, Amendment 1 that the amendment be made. Do you want to withdraw? Do you want to um, yes, we discussed this already, yeah. and this is yeah deletion. Uh, I I, 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 I move and withdraw this amendment. Uh, uh, Consider bringing it forward at report stage. Uh, amendment 6 then already discussed with 1. Lee, I move and withdraw. Amendment 7, then, already discussed with 3. Withdraw. Amendment 8, already discussed with 4. Yeah, based on what the Minister has said in, in looking at this in report stage, I move and withdraw. Okay. That's Section 4, some part of the bill. Agreed. Agreed. Section 5, uh, that's Section 5, some part of the bill. Um, Do you want to comment on that, Deputy Doherty, Deputy McGrath? No. no. Um, section 6, then. Um, section 5 agreed. Section 5 agreed? Agreed. agreed. Section 6, Amendment 9 uh, is out of order. Potential charge on the revenue. So that Section 6 stand part of the bill? Can I just something in, in terms of Section 6? Um, the, the, um, the subsection 1 states that the information will be made available to the state to enable us to identify factors uh, that influence the cost of insurance. Uh, but to what end and who is actually going to get uh, this information and what are they going to do with the information uh, is the first point uh, and I think it is a fundamental issue. Um, the, there has to be transparency. Will a potential new competitor for example, have access to that, that information that I refer to in subsection 1. The section also brings up questions of delegation again, and this is the trend in, in, in the legislation. Uh, we look at the, the language in, in this section, it's, it's in the opinion of the bank, give special consideration to any views expressed by the minister, shall be carried out from time to time as occasion requires. And, and in my view, this is opposite to what we need to be doing, which is bringing in far more robust uh, legislation that isn't about that isn't as opaque as 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 this section appears. Um, the, the the so there is a concern here that uh, which is a concern throughout the bill, notwithstanding my support for the purpose of the bill, that that we're it's quite opaque. But my fundamental question is is in relation to the information in subsection one. What is who is who, what is the state going to do with this information when they get it? To what end are they going to collect the information, and will uh, new competitors have access to that information referred to? 
Yeah, the section provides the central bank with powers to specify the classes of non-life insurance that are relevant by way of regulations without having to name the class of non-life insurance within primary legislation. This therefore allows for the extension of the scope of the database to different classes of non-life insurance in the future on foot of an assessment by the central bank of the appropriateness of such an extension after consultation with the Minister for Finance without requiring further amendments to the legislation. The section therefore provides for the number of principles and policies in which one of the guiding principles around any potential extension of scope relates to the cost of that class of insurance. As per the recommendation of the Cost Insurance Working Group, it is intended at the first, in the first instance that the database will focus on private motor insurance sector and consequently it is proposed that this area will be subject to the first set of regulations to be developed by the bank. I believe that this is important to give appropriate consideration to expanding, before expanding to other classes of insurance. So, in terms of who, who gets it, um, there will be a report published uh, at least annually, deputy. And the example that I've used in the past is that as the information flows, so when the first report is published, we'll have a decade of information. So, one of the things that, an example that I use previously, is that there could be 20, 30, 40 percent of the cases that are settled without a medical report. So if there is a huge flow of settlement of cases without a medical report, well then, then that falls within uh, the responsibility of those of us who set policy, uh, Department of Finance, the committee here, to then have a look at why insurance companies settle claims without any medical report. So somebody shows up and says they've been injured. Now, I've spoken with all the insurance companies and they all have different methodologies of how they calculate the reasoning why they make a payout and at what stage. Some of them settle very early. Some of them do settle without a medical report. Some of them, in my view, as I said, settle too early. That's on one side of the spectrum. And some of them will challenge people every step of the way, even though those people have been very clearly and very obviously had a case of damages against them to no fault of their own. So it's trying to see, to get a look at the information deputy, to see the flow, to see what's going on, because currently we don't have uh, any, we have some foresight on the settlement channels. The calculation is we know about 30% of the claims. So those are the claims that are settled in court, in public, and those are the claims that are also settled with PIAB. But there are 70% of the settlement channels that we have no information flow upon whatsoever. No, I'll leave it okay. at that. Uh, that's section 7 then, stand part, six. or sorry, 6, stand part of the bill. Read right, section 7 then, that's section 7, stand part of the bill. Anyone want to comment on that? No. Uh, section 8 then, uh, Amendment 10, name of De Deputy Doherty. Yeah. <coughs> Moving the amendment. I move the amendment, Amendment number 10, and this basically uh, deletes from the legislation the, la the words use its best endeavours to. Um, in relation to data to be collected by the bank from an insurance undertaking, under subsection 2, the insurance undertaking shall use its best endeavours to provide the information to the bank in such a form so that no individual is identifiable from it. Now, I think that's a huge amount of latitude being given to the insurance industry. Uh, they are not held to any standard, expect to do their, their best to protect it. Like, they, they need to, why should they be asked? They should provide it. They have the information. So why are we saying shall use its best endeavours? It should read the insurance undertaking shall provide the information to the bank in such a form so that no individual is identified from it. Yeah. Why are we saying, why are we giving them a, a, a get off the hook and saying, well, sure, I, I, I tried my best, Minister, you know yourself, it was, it was difficult, couldn't find the file, you know, I used my best endeavours. We should make it very clear that they have the responsibility uh, to provide the information in the form uh, that that is required. Yeah. 
The amendment is opposed deputy on the basis that the words highlighted for removal were specifically drafted by the Office of the Parliamentary Council to provide for the fact that it may be impossible for insurers to anonymize completely the information they are providing for the database. So what I'm talking about here, Deputy, is potentially a very large claim um, that might impact a small insurer. And it would be obvious then that that large claim that would have been public potentially then would be um, obvious who the, who the claim was. If we set this very high threshold, it could cause insurers to take an overly conservative view on what information it is comfortable to share with the bank, resulting in a deficit in usable data. It is opposed also on the basis that it is unnecessary in terms of data protection, as an appropriate safeguard has been included in the section to protect personal data. That is where insurers provide information from which an individual is identifiable. The central bank is mandated on section three, subsection three of section eight, to ensure that the information is not disclosed by it. And this requirement is in addition to, and not in substitution of any other data protection requirement in this bill or in the Data Protection Act 2018. So really what I'm saying here, Deputy, is if there are a number of cases that in insurance say, if we give you this information from us, aggregate it, and there may be a smaller number, but well, potentially we could be identifying somebody, and under data protection, we can't give you anything. We don't want that. We want the opposite. So that's the reason why best endeavors is being used in this section. Um, okay, I, I hear what the minister is, is saying, and I'll, I'll reflect on that in relation to the wider um, implications of those words within the, this, this section. Um, so I, 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 withdraw, I move and withdraw my amendment. Uh, amendment 11, 12, 13 and 14 are ruled out of order uh, due to potential charge on revenue. So the question now is, does Section 8 stand part of the bill? I just on that, Chair. Um, so Section 8, subsection 6, so by way of, of output from this database, so the central bank shall, from time to time, and at least once a year following the year in which the section has commenced, publish a report that relates to relevant non-life insurance business um, for, for certain purposes. So is that what the actual output from this database will be, a, a published report from the central bank? So it's not that there will be real-time access to the database by different stakeholders and so on. So what the world will see as such is what's published once a year by the, the central bank, which will be in aggregate form, yeah. presumably. Yeah. Yeah. And that is for the purpose then of your department, policy department makers? policy or potentially um, any insurance company who may wish to be looking to enter the market. So they'll have all the information flows. So if we take motor, they'll see that windscreen cover was X, uh, theft was Y, had X number of cases, uh, average claim per case, and everything that flows around that. And the level of detail that will be in this report, is that going to be determined by regulations? Regulations. Right. Section 8. Uh, first of all, I'm, I must say that I'm disappointed that my amendments were ruled out of order in relation to this uh, section, uh, particularly um, uh, number 13, amendment number 13, that simply deleted a paragraph which stated that any report published should not identify any particular insurance undertaken. I, I don't think that's appropriate. I think that we need to be discussing transparency here. Uh, and I think that. Uh, that, that uh, the, the publication of an insurance undertaking um, uh, is appropriate in, in, in certain circumstances. I, I do accept that the blanket deletion would delete the protection for individuals too, which is not the aim, and I'll examine this issue uh, at report stage. Um, but look, the, the, there, there is, uh, you know, we've discussed the issue of the use your, your, your best endeavours, uh, and, and that's in relation to the section that talks about providing the data, um, you, you'll, you'll be
be familiar, Minister, that under recommendation four of the report on cost of insurance, you sent a data template to the insurance industry back in May of this year. The idea was that they would have responded uh, to you uh, so that it could be published before the end of the year. They were also asked to respond by quarter three of 2018. Um, they have told you it's not going to happen, but they've told you they've started collecting the data, and that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, you know, we're dealing with an industry which, as I said, I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them in, 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 in certain regards. Um, yet, there is language in this bill that we, I think we need to examine in, in report stage that, uh, that looks at um, some of these issues. I also had an amendment that was ruled out of order on this, subsec on this section that would have given a greater breakdown of each expenditure type in the settlement channels and one that would have empowered the central bank to correct public statements by insurers that are not accurate. I, I think that those amendments should be considered by the department. I think the more granular detail, the detail we have, and you, know, you, you mentioned in terms of consumer protection and the role, and the central bank should uh, be empowered to correct public statements by insurers that aren't accurate. Uh, because this is deeply mi misleading. I, I do want to make a point in relation to uh, another uh, amendment that was ruled out of order. Ken Corley, you're getting very strict on the, or Cahirla, you're getting very strict on uh, disallowing all my amendments. Uh, I, you're getting very soft on the insurance industry, may I say. Um, I, I have the letter with your signature and everything to prove. I'm only, uh, I, I know it's not you. Uh, it wasn't it's, me. It's whoever pulling your strings. <laughs> but look, there is a number of amendments that have been ruled out of order. But can I make this point in relation to one of them, uh, and that is uh, an amendment that I had that was ruled out of order for reasons beyond my understanding. Uh, what we were told uh, in the official response as to why it was ruled on, out of order is that it would impose a charge on the state. Uh, and this was to ensure that, to specify that motor insurance or public liability insurance would actually be subject to this database. Now, we all know here that motor insurance, that the intention is that motor insurers would be subject to this database. But it doesn't actually say that in the bill. Uh, you know, so that, that's, what the, that's what the amendment did. It was actually to ensure that the central bank actually does do that, because we don't say it. It's not in the legislation. So it was ruled out of order because it would, uh, uh, it would be a charge on the state. How the hell could it be a charge on the state unless it's not intended to be done in the bill in the first place? If the, in if the intention is that this is what the bill is all about, then it, obviously by stating it in the bill, by the way, just let's state the obvious that under no circumstances can you not include motor insurance in, in relation to this database uh, and then it's ruled out of order because that could be a charge in the state. It can be a charge in the state if it's going to happen. And therefore, this leads to, when we leave this legislation, when, when it passes this, the House of the Rock, this when it's signed into law by the President, it goes over to the central bank, which no harm to them. We can't go in and you know, go through this again. This is our opportunity to, to, to be tight, to make sure that what we want is there. So you know, those issues... I will talk to uh, those responsible for, for ruling these out of order and to get a better understanding of the reasons. But I, I make those points to say that the Minister should look at clarifying uh, these issues uh, by looking at some of the amendments that have been ruled out of order that we haven't had a, uh, an opportunity to discuss in, in great detail in terms of back and forth. Um, but I would ask him to, 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 to look at them before report stage. Okay. I, uh, Chair, Chair, please. Um, can, can I say, first of all, that I'm strongly of the view that every person who is participating in the conversation about insurance has one objective, and that's to improve the market, improve the sector. <coughs> um, and I accept everybody's bona fides in relation to that, absolutely unquestionably. Uh, I'm happy to work with anybody who has a view or an opinion that they want to improve I can't say I'll accept it, but certainly I'm open to listening to somebody else's view and someone else's opinion. So that offer is there between now and report stage. Thank you. Uh, uh, that section eight. Uh, yeah. And section eight. Just in, in relation to the uh, previous discussion, um, what kind of an amendment uh, would be acceptable to the department 
that would focus on, if you like, cost comparisons, information in respect of other European countries, and comparative cost details. After all, the central bank is part of the European system of banks. And the problem with central bank reports is that a lot of them, from the point of view of ordinary people, inevitably are highly technical. So would the minister, uh, you know, would you be agreeable to actually providing broadly based information and comparators, including of all the other countries, uh, in the European banking system because they all collect data, so that's not uh, putting any big burden on anybody. But it would also enable us in the ongoing conversation about insurance and how expensive it is and so on, to actually build up over a period of time comparators that would actually be useful to policymakers here, but would also give us insights into what, what if you like, how much as it were, value for money is insurance in Ireland compared to how much it costs. Like we have a lot of anecdotal uh, information that in a lot of other European countries which are part of the same European central banking system, financial services uh, like insurance services are simply not as expensive as they are in Ireland. Um, so, I mean, would you be open to discussing or even showing us as it were, what this shadow, what this report is likely to look like. And given that uh, the bank's a member of the European system, can uh, we not see how then it shapes up in terms of this kind of regulation with its uh, other European banks? I mean, would you accept an amendment like that? I, I appreciate this is a uh, finance bill, so like the ball is entirely in your court as Minister, as to whether or not you accept or reject an amendment? Yeah, no, I wouldn't accept an amendment of that nature, Deputy. Um, the bill is to do a job. The job is to collect the Irish information. Not France, not Spain, not Germany, not anywhere else, and make comparators. So you made the point that insurance value in Ireland is poor, is effectively what you're saying, in comparison to other jurisdictions. Uh, there's a single reason for that. We have the highest awards in the world. We have the highest what? Awards in the world. <coughs> yeah. yeah. That's the reason why it's expensive here. And that's why it's much less expensive in other jurisdictions. How do we know that? Every, everything that we're doing, Deputy, is to try and reduce premium. So in terms of motor insurance, we're down 23% since the peak, according to the CSO. And this will be a really important aspect of reducing further uh, premium. Uh, this, along with the personal, how do, you, you, you asked me how do I know about the awards, so we've benchmarked the awards in Ireland um, by Justice Nicholas Kearns in the Personal Injury Commission report. So on average, um, soft tissue award in Ireland is 4.4 times more. So if you're getting 10,000 in the UK um, euro, you're getting 44,000 euros here. Um, this is not an attractive jurisdiction for insurance companies. How do I know that? Quite a few of them have left. And they've left because the sector is expensive, the awards are high, and a lot of those companies weren't profitable. And it's very easy to remove their capital and go somewhere else where jurisdictions are better operationally. So everything we're doing, as I've said, this is an important piece of legislation to get through the houses. Uh, the recalibration, according to Justice Kearns, should happen by the, the Judicial Council when they're established. I met with, I met with Minister for Justice, um, Minister Flanagan, and the expectation is that all of that will be concluded, the establishment of the legislation for the Judicial Council, the establishment of the Council, and then the work for the recalibration of the Book of Quantum, <coughs> which will reduce the awards um, well, well, that's when you'll see a further decrease in premium, and that's the objective by everybody, in my view, in this chamber, um, here and now. Okay. Section 8, then, is part of the bill. Um, section 9, then. That's Section 9, stand part of the bill? Agreed. Section 10, that's Section 10, stand part of the bill? Agreed. Section 11. 
amendment. I just sorry, ask in relation sorry, to sorry, section sorry, ten. Sorry. You want to ask a question in relation to section ten? Yeah. Yeah. I, w I want to ask the same question. What is the amount of information that, if you like, the general public, ordinary consumers are going to be given in respect of this particular section? I mean, look, if, if we're setting up a database in which eventually we'll have anonymised data, I, I can't understand why on a regular basis it would not be part of the central bank function to actually as is done in a lot of other European countries, provide information into the public domain about uh, what uh, information broadly has been gleaned. We're not, I'm not asking for personal details in relation to anything. I'm asking for information that's useful to consumers. And, uh, you know, I mean, your concern, I, I understand, is with the insurance industry. But I, I think, you know, there needs to be a lot of concern about the consumers who are paying very high premiums here. Well, if you were here earlier, Deputy, you would have heard Deputy Doherty's view about uh, consumer protection with the central bank and my agreeing with that view. Um, the information flow will benefit consumers based upon policy direction. So, as I said a moment ago, we have about sight of 30% of the settlement channels. We have no sight over exactly how the awards uh, are affecting the premium. Uh, we've no sight over these, but we will have sight <laughs> over these when this legislation is passed. So when we pass the legislation, potentially there will be more information to 70% of the settlement channels where we have no knowledge of, nothing, no flow, um, will be available. We'll be able to see have are some companies or a percentage of companies settling too early? Are some companies settling without a medical report? Because it's probably cheaper commercially. Um, and if that is the case, well, then it falls within the gambit of the Oireachtas to do something about that. If we, if, but we won't see until we get the information flow. So the information flow will be a 10-year look backwards. Some of that work is done already in terms of the uh, types of insurance and types of flow. So section 10 is part of the bill. Agreed. Section 11, Amendment 15, in the name of the Minister. Okay. Thank you, Chair. The amendment is proposed on foot of our consultation with the European Central Bank to set out in clear terms that the Minister shall provide funding to the Central Bank to carry out its functions under the Bill in the event of a shortfall in funding Members will recall that I outlined in the course of my second state speech that the Minister consulted with the ECB in July to seek its assessment of the Bill in relation to the prohibition on monetary financing under Article 123 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU as the Bill confers new tasks on the Central Bank with regard to collecting data that seeks to improve transparency in the insurance sector. In response, the ECB invited the Minister to clarify through appropriate amendments that any anticipated or actual shortfall of funds to the freighted bank's expenses under the draft law will always be granted by the Minister on a regular and prompt basis as the costs arise to ensure that the bank does not have to fund the cost of its task under draft law from its own funds. Further information was provided on this to you in the briefing sent to the Committee. As a result, I'm introducing this technical amendment to Section 11, Subsection 3, to reflect that the Minister shall, rather than may, on the written request of the Bank, advance to the Bank such sums he thinks he, she thinks proper to enable the Bank to defray all of its expenses arising in that year associated with the function the Bank is required to perform under the legislation. I believe that this amendment on balance is sufficient to address any hypothetical concerns around future monetary financing raised by the ECB in their opinion. Members? Okay, the uh, amendment 15, that the amendment be made? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, that section 11 as amended stand part of the bill? Agreed. Agreed. Section 12 then, amendment 16 in the name of Deputy Doherty is ruled out of order. Do you want to speak to that section, Deputy Doherty? No. Uh, that section 12 stand part of the bill? Agreed. Agreed. Um, section 13 then, amendment 17 
uh, in the name of the Minister. It's a, a new section. 17 and 18 are related. Uh, 18 is consequential. 17, 17 and 18 will be discussed together. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> the proposed amendment is designed to amend the Civil Liability in Court Act 2004 to give effect to recommendations made by the Cost of Insurance Working Group. The amendment was considered carefully by the Department of Justice and the Office of the AG during the formal drafting process. This consideration took into account the need for balance and constitutional proportionality that have been signed off by the Attorney General. Therefore, while legislation can always be challenged, we are satisfied that constitutional issues should not arise in the context of these two limited amendments and that there should not be any unintended negative consequences for genuine claimants. The amendment deals, section 8 of the, of the section, the amendment deals first with the letter of claim and the potential consequences of a failure to serve a notice in writing on the alleged wrongdoer within a prescribed period from the date of cause of action, currently two months. The Cost of Insurance Working Group formed a view that Section 8 should be amendment, amended to enhance the effectiveness of this statutory requirement. The key aim of this amendment is to reduce the notification period for the serving of a letter of claim from two months to one month to align the time period with data protection legislation and the new data GDPR regime which came into force on the 25th of May of this year, which provides that data shall not be kept for longer than is necessary for the purposes for which it is obtained, generally no more than one month. However, an exception to this rule is where information on CCTV footage or video footage or digital footage is held in the context of an investigation such as a personal injury claim. Consequently, by requiring a plaintiff to notify a defendant within one month of an alleged incident under Section 8, the defendant will be given the opportunity to identify within the data protection time limits any footage that may have they may have of the incident and keep it beyond that one month period for investigation purposes where they believe the claim is questionable. This earlier notification period would also help a defendant prepare their defence in a range of other ways such as being able to put together more accurate employee witness statements where this is relevant. It may also help the defendant in accepting their liability as early as possible thus enabling the claim to be settled quickly for minimal legal fees incurred. The existing wording of Section 8 needs to be strengthened in order to ensure that it is used more effectively by the courts. In this regard, it is proposed that instead of a court having the option to draw inferences from the failure to serve a letter of claim on the alleged wrongdoer within the prescribed period of time, through the use of the word may, that it should, should be required to do so as a matter of course through the use of the word shall. It should also be noted that these inferences may not always be negative as the court may conclude that there was reasonable cause for delay in notification. However, where the inference is negative, the court may make no order as to the payment of costs to the plaintiff or deduct such amount from costs that would be that that would but for this section be payable to the plaintiff as it considers it appropriate. Finally, on this part of the amendment, the working group believes that the words as or as soon as practical thereafter should be deleted as this allows arguably too much latitude to a plaintiff to delay unnecessarily before notifying the defendant. The working group, however, is of the view that the deletion of the words sufficient protection still remains for the plaintiff in this section as only where there is a failure without reasonable cause can a court draw a negative inference. That's section 8, Chair. Thanks, Minister. Deputy Doherty. Yeah, um, Minister, the, this amendment um, in relation to, you know, the data protection in GDPR seems sensible in terms of moving from two months to one month. Um, so I, I don't really have, have an issue with that uh, as such. But I do have an issue, I must say, in relation to the other parts of, of, of what you've done here. You know, you've, you've re removed the or, or as soon as practical thereafter, um, which allows for the court to decide whether it's practical or not. You've then um, determined in, le in law that the court shall draw an inference. And while the 
note that you provided us says that that inference can be positive. The reality is, <laughs> inferences are you know that the, that language is, is a negative language. Is ne it is designed to be a negative conclusion. The court has the power, if they so, so wish, to draw an inference. Um, and the reason it's written in that way because inferences are negative. So it can draw a negative uh, view in relation to this. Now you're saying they shall do it, but well, they kind of can they say, well, actually, this is a good thing, you know, that um, they're, 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 there's not negative there. So I think that there's a there's a serious issue in relation to this. Um, I think that the amendment to so, section 14 of the 2004 Act, um, look. At the end of the day, I think it's 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 tinkering around the edges. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure. I haven't heard any reasonable explanation as why a fraudulent claimant would actually delay their own proceedings. I, I don't understand why that is. Um, you, so, um, but that's that's not the that's not the core issue I have. But the core issue I have here is that what you've done on the on the the amendment is you've taken a number of steps um, which we all want to see fraudulent claimants stamped out and I, I repeat the point and I would maybe give you the opportunity to outline to us your um, conversations with the guard the Commissioner Drew Harris in relation to the establishment of a, of, of, of a, 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 a funded um, fraud squad within the um, within the insurance fraud squad within the, the Gardaí and whether you have reviewed your, the official position is that that should be industry funded. Um, but there is a number of steps here, which is it goes from two months to one month. There's no as, pra as soon as practical thereafter, uh, although there is another la piece of language in it which is still is more restrictive. And then that the court has to draw an inference as opposed to that the court may draw an inference. And then obviously the, the, the penalty in relation to, you know, genuine claimants um, who, who who are making a claim who fail to uh, fulfil with subsection four, is that an order of uh, costs uh, could be uh, made against them uh, or deduct the cost from that that would for that part uh, be 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 made against them as well. So it's quite it's quite. Um, it's it's quite far-reaching, um, so for that reason, I can't support this 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 amendment. Um, but let me say, I want to support the the, the 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 core principle of it, which is the issue of from two to one. I I don't have an issue in relation to that, but I think you need to revisit this at report stage. I think that the there's no reason the court shall the court may is if it, if the court so decides that there's reason why. Uh, 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 the claim has not been served on, on the individual, within, then it's up to the court to draw. The, the, they're empowered to draw it, and we should allow them to, to, to draw that, to, to dictate that they shall. There is the, the problem here is that it, for genuine claimants, you're making it harder. And you know, on the other side of this here, because, and rightly so, we're focused here, we're looking at this legislation through the lens of let's stamp out fraudulent claims, let's drive down insurance premiums, but there is also a responsibility on us to look through the lens of people who are making genuine claims, and is this now creating an extra three hurdles that allows for the insurance companies, which are multi-million and multi-billion industries, uh, with their you know, lawyers going up against you know, the, the individual uh, who was uh, involved in a genuine personal in injuries accident, whether it was motor or whatever, uh, and going up against, you know, you know, uh, Goliath, and 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 this now provides additional ammunition uh, for the industry. Yes, to tackle fraudulent claims, but it also does in relation to genuine claims, and that's where I think that we've got the balance wrong here. Chair, oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, I would just like to ask the minister if he could give us a copy of his detailed note. Uh, because we've only received the information about this uh, very recently. And it's a very big step up. Uh, it's been customary for finance ministers to give the detailed notes if uh, members request. We, we got this at short notice. It, it's potentially a very big change. Um, 
did the Attorney General give advice on this? Because it's, it's, it's a very direct direction to a court uh, of a kind that, say for instance, you have an honest claimant who is caught out by this, do they have any mechanism, as it were, to appeal what, 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 what's becoming a kind of an automatic process that I think you, as Minister, are trying to imp impose on the court. So, A, could you just give us the detailed notes um, uh, so that we could get some advice on it? But secondly, could you tell us how, what mechanisms, if any, do you have in mind that would ensure that if there is an honest claimant, and like remember the vast majority of people are honest, I know the Minister and everybody else, we have a terrible problem with fraudulent claims, uh, and I, we're all united uh, in wanting to stamp that out. But, but this is, I, I think, quite a big step up, and we really didn't hear much about it. We just got handed it the other day, and I, I, I would just like uh, more detailed information from the Minister. And what happens to an honest claimant who, for certain reasons perhaps, uh, doesn't meet the deadline, isn't met the one month? Uh, what recourse do they have, if any? Because normally in these kind of situations, there, there's an inbuilt, uh, if you like, for want of a better word, it's not an appeals mechanism, but you can go back and uh, seek you know, uh, uh, a remedy if for, 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 for some reason it really wasn't possible to comply with this regulation. Deputy McGrath. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I mean, in, in, in broad terms, uh, I support uh, this amendment. I think there are um, still a number of, of caveats in place. I mean, the, the change which requires a court to, um, to draw inferences um, is also subject to uh, the without reasonable clause that remains in place. So if there's a reasonable cause for the delay, um, then the, the court uh, being mandated to draw inferences does not apply. So I think that's the first point. And the second point is uh, in the court drawing inferences, the implication of that really is around costs as set out in um, B, subsection B, 1 and 2. Uh, but again, that's only where the interests of justice so require. So again, that is down to uh, the interpretation and the judgment uh, of the judge. So I think there are caveats here and safeguards, but look, it's important that this is properly uh, discussed and, uh, and, and teased out. The question I have, Minister, is what practical difference you feel this will make in a scenario where somebody, uh, a claimant, does not notify, um, let's say, a business owner of an incident uh, and waits until the eve of the two-year anniversary uh, to, to lodge a claim and that's the first that the, uh, the, the business, the policyholder, uh, would have heard of it, uh, which you know, is still permitted. They will still be able to do that, not notify um, the business of, uh, of an alleged incident uh, and take the claim on the eve of the second anniversary. So in practical terms, what difference do you believe that this change to Section 8 will make in the, the work through of that situation? Uh, just, uh, I'll start with Deputy McGrath and work backwards, uh, Chair, if you don't mind. Um, the number of occasions that businesses have come to me and presented that they have a claim made against them uh, 18 months later and they were in a business, whether it's a, you know, best, the best example I gave is a nightclub or, or uh, the hospitality sector, and the business isn't able to defend themselves because there was potentially no report of any incident of any nature, either to a staff member um, or at any stage that there was an incident of any nature, whatever the hue and cry of the nature was. So they have no method in which they can defend themselves, the business owner. And I just want to factor into Deputy Doherty's point about why would a fraudulent claim delay proceedings? The best ploy that a fraudulent claimant has is to go in late, there's no evidence potentially with the business owner about an incident, and drag it on for three to five years. Because there's a potentially open claim 
on the business's books for that period of time. And, adventure, and the number of occasions, Deputy, that business owners have come to me who've said it is cheaper to pay the claimant off, on, even though they have no knowledge if there was any, ever any incident of any nature. But as long as there's an open claim on their books with their insurance company, the premium increases. Can I just make a point sure. just to clarify that, here? Because when I talked about the why would it be in the benefit of a fraudulent claim is to delay, under the circumstances you've outlined, yeah. that's obvious uh, why there would be a benefit to delay, and that's, I think, why Deputy McGrath's question is relevant. But what I was talking about is subsection 14 of the Act, where we're talking about where proceedings have already uh, been served. And that's what, the this, affidavit. Sorry, that's what, the affidavit. This, what this requires is an affidavit to be sworn to say that the, the, what is in the pleadings are an accurate, are an accurate and yeah. true reflection. And the point I'm making is, so if a fraudulent claim has already began, so you know that's that's the case. Why would what is why would why would it be in the advantage of a fraudulent claimant to not swear their 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 pleadings because they have to do so before before the court anyway at some point and, and all it does is delay the case. Uh, that's the point I'm saying, and you know that it wasn't in relation to the delay. I understand the delay. That's why I think the two months to one month is is beneficial, notwithstanding. The, the real impact of this. I'll take section 14 after, Deputy, if you don't mind, because that, that's the section 14 element of it. But in my view, and the number of businesses who have who presented to me is almost 100% complete, that the, the number of occasions that there are fraudulent claims that show up, that they have no evidence against that an incident happened at all is huge. It's, it's, it's enormous. So. Before the data protection laws change in 25th of May, heretofore they could keep the footage for as long as they wanted. Months, two years, whatever the period is. But now the law of the land says the footage must be deleted after one month. And I think it's absolutely wholly appropriate that we merge the period of the footage retention and the period of which people have to be notified that potentially there is a case. In terms of the we're not removing from the court in any way the court's flexibility in terms of somebody who is making a legitimate claim. And again, it is important to put on the record that on every occasion I meet businesses or groups who are concerned about insurance, everybody wants to ensure that the legitimate claimant is compensated. Everybody. And I think ourselves here also. And that's why we have reasonable cause in the section to ensure that if somebody has a legitimate, reasonable cause, why the person wasn't notified, that the judge considers that and the court considers that matter and is a matter for the court. We're not impacting upon that. But the inference, and this goes back to, to the working group, the inference still remains that the, protect, that the plaintiff in this section where there is a failure without a reasonable cause. If somebody rocks up to the, with an insurance claim one year, 11 months, three weeks, and three or four days later, and again we're into the space where potentially the person who the claim is being made against has no evidence. The staff members might be gone. He mightn't even know who was working on that night. So now you have the potential for this to last two years, three years, four years. So the inference is without a reasonable cause. That's a matter for the court for a negative inference. And it is something I believe it's really important that we have enough protection in reasonable cause in relation to a notification that protects somebody. And I think the individual, and we, are, we are absolutely here to protect the individual who is dam a case for damages against a person um, legitimate cases. We are all, I think, to a one that we want to protect those people. But we have to give, we have to move to a new space and the two months to one month and the inference, I believe, crucial if we're going to really impact. Now, we can pretend that we're not going to impact and have this not really be legitimate. I'm not about that, nor do I believe this committee is. But if we want to impact, I believe this section is crucial. In terms of 
Um, we're not imposing on the courts. Yes, the AG gave his opinion, and the AG did give an opinion on this, and AG is comfortable with this. I am meeting Deputy, uh, meeting Commissioner Harris on the 11th of December, and I, I, I continually have to say this, I am not against the establishment of a Garda insurance section within the GNEB. I am not. I am opposed, it's a personal view, I made this point a long time ago, very early in the job, I am opposed to uh, the industry funding the section directly. If the industry provide the money to the minister, and the minister provides it to the Garda Shikana, I'm absolutely 100% comfortable with that. So it does the same thing, it's funded into the Exchequer, the Exchequer provides the same quantity of funding, I would actually be looking for additional funding, to be honest with you so that the insurance section is established. And that's what I will be saying. That's a personal view. But the Cost Insurance Working Group, which was presented before I came into the job, um, is the UK-based model. PIC also highlighted that. Um, but it is a matter for the Commissioner. And the Commissioner will then subsequently speak with the Minister for Justice in relation to the establishment of the section and how the section gets funded. Department. Well, in the history of fraud, the real deterrent to fraud is if there's the capacity to investigate fraud and then for the perpetrators of the fraud to be prosecuted. I mean, that's the critical issue. You're talking about company directors misbehaving, you're talking about bankers misbehaving, uh, and if you're talking about fraudulent insurance claims, I, what what I, I just don't understand is uh, why uh, is there not a structure developed which allows action? Because, I, I, I mean, I think we all hear it all the time of someone who comes in, uses a restaurant, and sometime later, having, as it were, possibly staged some kind of a claim, then makes a claim. And, as you say, uh, nobody has any much knowledge of it. But the only way to deter that is for some of the people who do that to, in fact, as happens in frauds in other areas that have involved business, is for the fraudsters to be prosecuted. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you've addressed that, Minister, but, uh, you know, there's, it's quite a scandal as well for people because judges openly say in court now uh, and cl cl claims are withdrawn and so on. Um, but yet, and I, I, just bear in mind again that the vast majority of people are completely honest, um, but they see people uh, apparently uh, being uh, spoken to by the judges and then they just walk away and we, well, we don't know, but it doesn't appear as though anything ever happens to them. Deputy Tarty. Minister, I just want to make my last remarks in relation to this, this bill and I, I obviously agree with the principle of the bill I think it's and we need to get this up and running as quickly as possible and personal injury claims as we've talked about in section 14 they should not be delayed they need with that needs to be part of the database uh, personal uh, public liability and uh, that needs to be part of it as not just just motor insurance but let me make this point because I've, I've made it on a number of occasions and um, with your predecessor and and yourself and the line minister any link between big private business funding directly or indirectly our police service is inappropriate. Whether it passes through your hands before it gets to the, the Gardaí, it doesn't matter. It is not acceptable. It would also not be acceptable if a philanthropist out there came to the Minister and said, I will fund a section of the Gardaí to investigate rogue or corrupt politicians. We wouldn't, it wouldn't be done or if a big businessman decided that he wanted to investigate a certain part and pass the money through the Department of Finance. We need to establish as a matter of principle, do we collectively believe that the Gardaí should have an insurance fraud squad? I think that everybody in this committee, I, I believe everybody in the House of the Raptors believes that that is the case. Then we need to publicly resource it. And I would say to you before you meet with uh, the, the Garda Commissioner, that you should get the commitment from the Minister and make it clear to him that the House of the Raptors stand four square behind him. He is obviously independent in terms of how he structures the Gardaí, but it is the view of the Raptors and the view of this Finance Committee that there should be such a unit within the Gardaí and that the necessary resources will be made available. 
whether we want to charge additional money through taxes or levies on the insurance industry should be a secondary issue. Uh, but I do welcome the fact that your, your comments in terms of your own personal view on, on relation to this. But let me make it clear that, from my point of view, whether it ha passes through the hands of the minister before it gets to the industry, it, it's still the precedent exists, and it is just it is not right. And I can understand, you know, because how frustrating it is to see people who have had their claims dismissed in court by the judge, taken up time in court and all the rest, uh, and dismissed as fraudulent claims, and they walk out with a worry in the world, because they're not going to be prosecuted. So we need to deal with this, we need to deal with it quickly, and I would ask you to take that issue off the table and get the commitment from your Cabinet colleagues to actually make the resources available, and I'm sure that I can only speak for my own party, that, we'll, we'll, that we'll, you will have full support in relation to that uh, from our party, because it needs to be done and needs to be done urgently. Okay. The question is then that the new section be there inserted. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 13 stand part of the bill. Uh, section 14 now. That section 14 stand part of the bill. Uh, Yeah, the 18 then uh, already discussed with 17. Uh, so that the amendment be made. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, that this be the title of the bill. An act to confer a function on the Central Bank of Ireland with respect to the collection and study of data from insurance undertakings in relation to the carrying on of certain non-life insurance business in the state and in particular information on the income generated by and costs associated with the carrying on of such business. For those purposes, uh, to amend Schedule 2 to the Central Bank Act 1942 and Section 22 of the Central Bank Supervision and Enforcement Act 2013. In relation to personal injuries actions, to amend in certain respects the Civil Liability and Courts Act 2004 and to provide for related matters. Is that agreed? Agreed. So the meeting, sorry, the bill is completed um, and according to Standing Order 90, the following message was sent to the Clerk of the Dáil. The Select Committee of Finance, Public Expenditure and Reform and Taoiseach has completed its consideration of the Central Bank National Claims Information Database Bill 2018 and has made amendments thereto. So the meeting is now adjourned until 2 o'clock on Tuesday the 4th of December. Thank you for your... your efforts in this and the committee on based insurance. I think we're all on the same pathway and it is appreciated. Thanks Minister and thanks to your officials. Thank you. Thank you.